Sometimes I dream of the old days when we still lived above ground, before the Great War, before the suffering, before my mother was killed in the toilet paper riots of 2013. I dream of the park. When I was very young, my mother used to bring me to the park on summer afternoons. One day, as we walked along, a strange gangly man approached us. He gazed down at me, but upon seeing my face he became deranged. He screamed and ran in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, the opposite direction was the street, and he was hit by a truck and killed. I never forgot that day. One year later, the war began. It all started with the strike. The New York Toilet Paper Union's contract fell through and all the factories shut down. Within days, there was a massive shortage. People didn't panic at first. They thought it would all pass. But they were wrong, so wrong. As the days turned into weeks, people began mugging each other on the streets. As the weeks turned into months, underground toilet paper smuggling rings began gaining power and influence destroying anything that could be used as a toilet paper alternative. Then finally, miraculously, the strike ended. But this proved only to be the beginning of the end. One by one, all the factories were destroyed, bombed by these new underground factions who profited from the shortage. These tribal warlords hoarded toilet paper and bought influence with it over politicians, policemen, and anyone else of power. People tried other methods, but none was efficient enough for mass use. People began rioting, fighting to rebuild the factories and jail the warlords. But one by one, they were all silenced. Soon the streets were no longer safe, and most retreated underground. Buildings were left abandoned and the city was controlled by the new government. The government of fear, crime, and greed. The toilet paper government. Dealing not in green currency, but in white. Now men lived and died by the roll. My mother had been dead for years, and I wandered the streets as an orphan. One day, a man claiming to have a large amount of jello lured me underground. But he had no jello. He locked me in a small room, and after that, I didn't see him again. I got used to it after a while. They slipped some food under my door from time to time, and I could shout to other guys they had locked up. They always yelled about the doctor, though I didn't know who that was. They were the ones who told me that the building was an abandoned college dormitory, which explained the magazines in my room. It wasn't really so bad in there with those things. I would read them a lot. I would fall asleep and dream of the old times, the park, the fresh air, and my mother, although I couldn't even remember what she looked like. Then one day I woke up, and I wasn't in that room any longer. I knew right away what was happening. I knew the man standing over me was the doctor. I thought there were others in the shadows, but I couldn't see them. I didn't resist. My cell wasn't much better anyway. The doctor blindfolded me and hooked something to my ears. Then, he spoke in a heavy German accent. He told me I had been selected for an important project, an experiment. I asked why me, and he said it was because I was Asian. It was kind of offensive, but I didn't say anything. Then, he explained my mission. He said I would be sent back in time to before the war began. He told me I would have to find Zetaschel, and when I told him I didn't speak German, he became frustrated. He finally showed me that he was referring to toilet paper. He said I would collect as much of Zetaschel as possible and hide it in a basement that would someday become our facility. I tried to explain to him that if this plan were going to work, Zetaschel would already be there, and hence, he would have no reason to send me back in the first place. He looked puzzled, and I asked if he had ever seen Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Suddenly, he threw a switch, and I blacked out. I ended up on a shelf. The room was bright and clean, safe. It felt like my childhood. My clothes were different. My hair was gelled. 
Finally, I realized what was around me. It was majestic, glorious, a wall of heavenly white that would be my salvation. I had found toilet paper. But soon I learned that my task would not be as easy as it seemed. I had forgotten that in the old days, people bartered with useless, abrasive green paper. Unfortunately, the doctor had forgotten this as well. I thought perhaps I could escape with some under my shirt. Then I realized that I probably couldn't. It hit me all at once that I was going to fail my mission. I had come all this way, and now I would have to face the doctor empty-handed. I fell to my knees and screamed. I screamed and screamed and screamed. The doctor was furious. He told me that if I didn't find Zatashal, he would make me listen to Bjork for eight hours straight. I said he was bluffing, but he assured me he wasn't. Reluctantly, I prepared to go back in time once more. With a smile, he threw the switch. I heard familiar sounds and thought for a moment that I had returned to the park of my youth, but I hadn't. I scanned the area to see if anyone was carrying toilet paper. I saw a woman looking out at the river and thought maybe she knew where I could find some. I walked over to her slowly and tried to play it casual. Finally, I started a conversation. I said, pardon me, miss, would you happen to have a roll of toilet paper? She thought I was joking and laughed it off, but I persisted. Again, I told her, I could really use some toilet paper. This time she understood and said she had some toilet paper back at her apartment. She asked if I would like to go get it, and I graciously accepted. We got upstairs and I asked her where the toilet paper was. She told me and I began searching for it. I assumed that something of such great value would be carefully hidden. To my surprise, it was right out in the open. For a moment, I reflected upon just how beautiful it was. I knew that the doctor would be pleased and thought perhaps he might even grant me my freedom. But then the woman told me that she had more toilet paper on her bed I should see. Excitedly, I followed her to her room. She pulled me inside and shut the door. We never made it to the bed. The next morning I woke up feeling things I'd never felt before. Everything felt right with her next to me. But something was wrong. Zatasha. Zatasha was gone. I had dropped it. Zatasha. 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 I decided to just go back to sleep. I would deal with it later. Or not. The doctor asked me calmly why I had not retrieved any toilet paper. I told him it was because I had fallen in love and nothing else mattered to me. He looked down upon me with vengeance, and then he proved to me that he hadn't been bluffing. horrible. The pain was unbearable, like being stabbed in my ears with a thousand knives. I would have done anything to make it stop. When the doctor finally silenced the music, I felt numb and paralyzed. He told me I had just one more chance. He said I wouldn't even want to know what he would do to me if I failed again. Luckily, I would never find out. I was finally back in the park. I smelled the sweet grass and heard the sounds of children playing. I walked toward the path I had often taken with my mother. Then, I saw the woman I loved. I ran to her, my heart fluttering with the knowledge that I had found her once again. But as I came closer, a strange, ominous familiarity came over me. I looked down at our baby, my baby, and realized what had happened. I couldn't bear to look at them, and I ran away. As I reached the street and saw the truck coming toward me, I recalled that day in my past, that day I had witnessed a man's death. And at that moment, I realized the man was me. <laughs>